Yeah, I just pressed went... record. All right, I just went live with the stream. It's Tuesday, April 16th, 2024. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, we are reviewing the tabletop sport, Kalask, with a K. You added an extra syllable there. <laughs> yeah, Kalaska. How many it's syllables? Not, you're, like, you're like, you're like, Kalask. It's Kalaska. Just no, it's Klask. <laughs> like, flask. Right? If one... But what if you just say it really slowly for some reason? Lask. Lask. You, don't have, you could you could minimize the. There is still a the, schwa. To, no matter how fast you say it, because you have to move your tongue, there is still a schwa sound, however brief, between k and l, because there's no way to transition between the two without k. Fl. Fl. Kla. Anyway, so uh, Sunday night, Emily and I walking home from uh, the Brooklyn. We're wandering around in the beautiful summer summer day, well, spring day, having a nice yeah, it's dinner. It's spring now, and it's going to be cold again, apparently. It was bullshit. It was like, what, 79 yesterday? <laughs> it's real nice right now, but oh, it's going to go home. back. It's going to go back to May 50, 60, barely And in fact, 60, you know, 90. a lot of times at the start of the show, uh, when it's, if the weather's nice, I'll talk about biking home from work, and there's always something crazy that happened. But today, you know what? Nothing crazy happened. As crowded as the bike lanes were, everybody's just super chill. Like, everyone's in a super good mood. Uh, there were more people biking uh, over the Queensboro Bridge than I have ever seen in my entire life, except during the Five Borough Bike Tour. Mm -hmm. But uh, so we're walking home and if you don't live in New York on the edge of Brooklyn and Queens. There's a tiny bridge called the Pulaski, not to be confused with another bridge also called the Pulaski that goes over uh, what I will charitably describe as one of the more polluted places in all of New York City. <laughs> it's not the Kiwanis Canal. It's no, a it's different the, canal. Yeah, I, one <laughs> of it is one of those little canals and it's a bad one. It's not the worst one, but it's not the best one, let's say. But you don't want to go in it. You don't want it to touch you in any capacity. But I think it's actually what Newtown Creek, I believe. It is Newtown Creek. And that area sucks not only because of that creek, but because a long time ago there was a huge petrochemical spill. And they're all still in the ground. And to this day, anytime it rains, the whole area smells vaguely of oil, which is fantastic because they just built a million apartment buildings there. Mm -hmm. But uh, so we're walking home. And that bridge has like a long ramp bike lane thing on either end of it. But right at the edge of this canal, there's stairs that go under the bridge up to the top. So there's a pretty quick path to go up these stairs, go across the bridge, go down these stairs, right back into Queens. Mm -hmm. uh, and increasingly, it used to be that place was really not sketchy in the way people who don't live in cities will think of a sketchy neighborhood. Sketchy in that it's just like this dirty industrial area full of debris. But yeah, uh, it was always empty. It's not a place that you would go on purpose, right? Nah. It's like you just, you, you know, if you're going over the bridge, you're going to the ends. You're not going down that middle staircase part. I've seen some people use it, but it was never really that common. I, I figured know. it was, Lots I figured it was most, I figured it was mostly used by the bridge operator to get to the booth. Nowadays, it is, a, it is a drawbridge. There are so many apartments over there and like breweries and things. There's every time I'm over there, there are a lot of people walking up and down all those stairs. Like they're, like, there's always people. It's a total change. Oh, go, go ahead. Use the stairs. Yeah. Maybe so we you use... can elevate there, too. Yeah. So we use the stairs. And as we're about to go up, we see a pigeon sitting in the middle of the stairs. It's no big deal. But as we approach the pigeon, the pigeon doesn't get out of the way at all. Then we realize the pigeon is in some distress. This pigeon, very clearly, as we determine later, and after some Googling, I actually figured out exactly what the compound is, must have landed on a roof that had just been covered with a very particular kind of cold sealant tar that is commonly mm. used in New York City specifically during the rainy season. Mm. All these factors matter because this shit is awful. It basically can't be cleaned off except via extremely complicated uh, procedures, which I spent a not lot even, of time not doing. Not even Dawn Soap, which they use. No, <laughs> they in fact, I'm glad They supposedly we... use that to clean the, the seals. Or they the oil do. Spills. So <laughs> I learned a lot about this. So number one, if you use Dawn Soap to save an animal from most kinds of oils and tar type things, if you put Dawn and water on the animal, you're going to make it worse 
for counterintuitive <laughs> reasons. You've got to put pure dawn directly and do a bunch of stuff, and you only add water at the last minute. Otherwise, you're actually going to make it like set more and make it harder to remove. And that's not <laughs> obvious unless you do a lot of Googling. But the all I know is that Dawn is great for dishes and bite when I get bike grease on my hands. Yep. Oh, Dawn is, Dawn is fantastic for the bite grease. <laughs> the, the, uh, any other, whenever I get bite grease on the hands, my hands are all black because I didn't wear gloves or the glove broke yep. or something. Regular, any other soap I own does nothing. And so, then, but Dawn, Dawn works. I would say 25% of the time when I get my hands covered in grease, it's because I was wearing gloves and they broke and I only had one pair and I wasn't going to go all the way back upstairs and I just dealt with it. The other 75% of the time, I just forgot to bring gloves down and I'm just, I don't care and I just do it and it's a mistake <laughs> and I regret it every time. <laughs> or I think, you know what? How much grease? I'm going to be careful. I won't get a ton of grease on my all hands. Right. You, found a, you found a pigeon covered in tar. Yep. So learned a bunch of things about this. Uh, the tar is hard to remove, but uh, we... Put the pigeon in a box. Actually, a local hotel is very kind to even help us get some gloves and everything. That uh, that fancy hotel that's right there. Uh, we got the pigeon home, and we learned a couple things. If you find an injured squirrel, robin, sparrow, pigeon, starling, or seagull, New York City on 3-1 actually has a very specific procedure and tell you very specific people to call. And if you can drop the animal off, they will absolutely help the animal out, and they want you I to I find do that this. really interesting because like, you think of those as like the the animals that like are are sort of beneath caring about like mm -hmm. they're just so you know it's it's like oh yes i found a i found a suffering earthworm <laughs> it's like yeah. a squirrel isn't really or a pigeon or sort of a rat are like on the lowest level of like you know it's not like you found an owl or an eagle yeah or oh there's uh, a different section for if you find one of them <laughs> Yeah, some like an actual animal that pe some human gives a shit about because it's rarer or bigger or smarter or less common. Uh, I, I said rare already. Yeah. You get what I understand? Yeah. People, you know, classify animals into different levels because of human reasons when actually all animals are basically equal. Yeah. I mean, what was that that lecture I keep I post a lot in all the discords I'm in and talk about a lot. Uh, but the one that talks about like what's the line of consciousness and the answer was basically pretty much anything that's warm blooded is definitely conscious to some degree. And the difference between all of yeah. them is way anyway, smaller than humans act like. The point is people want to save the whales. They don't want to save the squirrels. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, New York City, like there's a thing you can do, but we even found a better one. Now they still need to change the name. There's an unrelated controversy where the Audubon Society it's a fantastic organization that does a lot of good for birds and conservation, but it's named after Audubon, who wasn't just, like, problematic because it was olden times. He was, like, actively on the wrong side of history. This dude wasn't just had slaves. This dude was, like, pro-having slaves. Yeah, it's like, didn't the only good thing he'd do is draw a bunch of bird pictures? Yeah, and uh, but otherwise... Like, he, he, he drew pictures of lots of birds, right? Yeah. And then he got his name on the Bird Society. And basically, because the Bird Society has a lot of white people in it, and because they thought people... For a lot of stupid reasons, they won't change the name of the Audubon Society, despite the fact that it's basically the guy who didn't just own slaves, but fucking loved slavery and loved to talk about it society. But... Uh, Name notwithstanding, they also have a specific New York City thing. There's a, there's a place in Manhattan on Columbus Avenue. You don't even need to make he, an oh, appointment. He was good at drawing birds, though. Oh, yeah, he was real good at it. <laughs> I mean, Thomas Jefferson was real good at making stupid ideas sound smart, <laughs> regardless of his other problems. <laughs> but the Wild Bird Fund on Columbus Avenue, if you find any injured bird, you can just show up there, and they will totally help you out. And Any we, bird? Pretty much any bird. They they just do. If you've got an injured bird, take it here. We'll try to help. Mm, that was their capacity of bird acceptance. Well, Usually when, the uh, problem is a lot of those places, right? It's like they have limited, you know capacity resources and so they're they're in this place like new york city they're usually inundated and they sort of had to be picky and choosy you know? ah so there is a surprisingly extensive network of people kind of like how like we help with rabbit rescue sometimes like there's people who dedicate themselves to like i'll foster or i'll volunteer or like i'll accept an animal of a type that i am familiar with after a shelter has like done the hard part just to like get them back into the wild or do whatever. There is a substantial network of people who do this for pigeons in the city. And so far, like Probably we're going to same old people who are feeding the pigeons all the time. Cut that out. Old people. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, there's a difference between, you know, a pigeon that got like 
bit or something, and, but it's not dead yet, and feeding them bread. Though, as an aside, we kind of owe pigeons a little bit because they were domesticated, and then we abandoned them. That's kind of why they're so... I didn't do that. Yeah, but people did. <laughs> not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I'll, I'll post some links. If you if you live in New York City, at least, and you find a hurt pigeon, there are lots of places that will bend over backward to help you help that pigeon out if you're willing to do so. I do want to say I was in, just briefly, I was in Central Park over the weekend, and, you know, there were mad tourists there, as you would expect. Oh, yeah. Right? And uh, it was funny to me how many tourists were like, enjoying the squirrels right i enjoy squirrels to this day i will stop no 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 no. but it's like it's like i'm out there looking at like you know fancy bird and like that you don't see every day you know tree you don't see every day i'm looking at tourists also (laughs) you don't see every day (laughs) but it's like bro I, i grew up in a house for 18 years that just had squirrels around it at all times maybe not in the winter, but basically any time it was warm enough for a squirrel to come out the tree, (laughs) I could look out the window and there was a squirrel always there at all times. Do these people come from countries that like don't have squirrel or something? Like, I mean, to be fair, at least I never get tired of watching squirrels. squirrel. These were regular squirrels. They weren't even doing anything. I still like to just watch a regular squirrel because if you pick pick any squirrel that you can see and watch it for long enough and something funny is going to happen. But they weren't just sitting chilling and watching a squirrel. They were like going up to they were going up to the squirrel like it was like it was a zoo and the squirrel was the attraction. I'm like, bro, the zoo is right there. Yeah. You can go see you can go see all kinds of crazy shit in there. You think the squirrel's <laughs> exciting. Where do you get a load of this the zoo? <laughs> of course, think about in Australia. Like the the cockatoos there are basically like squirrels here. Like they're just everywhere. But when I was like when we were there and I was there again several times. I was really into like watching and interacting with the cockatoos and people who live there are like probably thinking, why the fuck is this guy paying attention to the cockatoos? They're everywhere. Doesn't he have cockatoos at home? So uh, in some Doesn't news... Does the Central Park Zoo have a grizzly bear? Wouldn't that be way better than I don't. I have not been to the Central Park Zoo in over a decade. I'm checking it. Hold on. Okay, they got a snow leopard. They got sea lions. I think the New York zoos love sea lions because Queens also has sea lion. They got a grizzly bear. They got some penguin. They got some red panda. They got some goat. And they got tropical birds like a toucan and shit. Mm. Lemur. Bat. All kinds of stuff. So, yeah. Uh, sorry. I know I, I started talking about how all anim- animals are equal and whatnot. But, like, if I'm going to go be entertained by an animal. <laughs> I don't know. Squirrels not have some innate. Entertainment. I'm not saying I value the squirrel's life less or more than the grizzly bear. I'm saying for my personal enjoyment, I would rather see grizzly bear. Yeah. So, uh, or snow leopard. In some news, uh, as of a hockey game that we just watched, the last hockey game of the season for the New York Rangers. Regular season. Yep. Now, now there's a different kind of season. The not the irregular season. Yep. The the be- <laughs> the best kind of hockey is about to happen. The playoffs, which I mean, if you're not a hockey fan, the difference between not just the vibe, because you expect the vibe to be different in any sport between the playoffs and the regular game, but like the way the game is played is different. Like it's such a different experience that playoff hockey is almost like its own thing. Well, the rules are slightly different and that the overtime is different. Yep. Um, and also the way that the, the structure around the games is different. It's sort of a, a tournament with sort of these best of sevens yep. rather than a points accumulation round robin ish yep. thing. The fact that you play um, that a team plays one other team and it's just they they adapt to each other. You gave one of you is gonna move on and one of you is not, and you're only playing against each other. Nothing matters, but can you beat this one team right yep. now. And, uh, you know, the players uh, care a lot more and they try a lot harder. Yep. And so the game is played differently than it is, even though the most of the rules are the same. They don't play it the same. And then, you know, everyone in the crowd is different. So, you know. Yep. So uh, the Rangers, their last game was a shutout for Mr. Igor Shosturkin. They won the President's Trophy. They set a whole that, bunch of... That means- if you don't know, that means that they are literally, if you look at only the regular season, they had the most points, so they were the best possible. Out of 32 hockey teams, they were number one, the best hockey team. If you only look at the actual results 
And you don't care about how the game's racked. How did they get those points? No, we're not thinking about that. Yeah, looking at you caps with, what, like 16 OTL points or whatever? Right. You're not caring about how the game, what happened in the games. Like, did they, right? It's like, you could have a team that could get, let's see, this, you know, in the, in the 82 games, you could have a team that wins, say, like, you know, 50 games right and like demolishes their opponents in 50 games and then and the other 32 games loses by like one right yeah. and you got to think that's a pretty good team right they either dominated shitty teams or they lost when they lost it was a close loss and they still got like 104 points that's playoff numbers right that's yeah. a great team right you could have another team that has 60 wins and the 60 wins, they, like, got by the skin of their teeth each and every one of those wins. They had a lot of overtime wins, yeah. shootout wins. And all the other games, the other 22 games, they lost. They got demolished. Like, and they lost to shitty teams. And they got beat, beat up by shitty teams. <laughs> now, the second team is going to have more points and is going to win the President's Trophy. But when you look at the games, you got to say the team that had eight fewer wins... It's obviously the better team. You're more scared to play them yep. than you're scared of the other team with more points. But then you also get the paper, rock, scissors of some teams do things that other teams struggle with to where a team that's bad, worse in most hockey attributes than another team might beat one very specific team in the playoffs because the thing they're good at is a thing that is like the counter to that yep. other team's whole deal. Well, you never know. Yeah, we're gonna find so, out. So, uh, yeah, this is this is the best the Rangers have looked in the entire Just time the last I've lived time in New they York won City. the President's Trophy in 2015. I think so. I was looking at the right. I think the Red Wings have the most President's Trophies with six. Mm. I got. I got. I got to look the at the history. President's Trophy again. isn't that old. It used to just be called the regular season championship. Yep. So and you'd have to you'd have to include those as well somehow. And while a lot of people like to talk about this, they're used to like the hockey fans like to talk about the curse, like oh having winning the president's trophy means No, you, it's not actually cursed. You, yep. you, you statistically <laughs> the teams that win it do very well in the playoffs historically. Although last year the Boston Bruins won it and went out in the first round. So. Yep. It teams have won anything. it and gotten swept out of the first round. Teams have won it and won the cup. Like it's all over the place. The, the only benefit of winning it means that no matter what, every game, every series the Rangers play in this playoff, which could be between one and four, yep. they will have home ice advantage. So four of the seven games, if you need all seven games, will take place at Madison Square Garden and not somewhere else. Real great for us with our half-season tickets. Uh, it's, yes, that means we will have more chances to go. So in a little uh, quickie news, too, uh, more sports on the Tuesday gaming day. Uh, one of the NHL teams just up and left. The Coyotes well, are, well, it's, it's complicated. Been, it's been brewing. It's been brewing. But now it's, they're in the, Boston. Brew, the brew is being poured <laughs> now. Right? Yeah, this is it's actually a really complicated deal, too. Like, so well, to summarize it as best I can, the Coyotes or the Coyotes are moving to Salt Lake City because they weren't like there was some trouble with the team. I think they weren't making no. so first of all, they had shitty attendance. Yep. And the owner is a, the organization was it was a, a mess, right? It's yep. a lot, you know, and they fucked up in the arena and the arena kicked them out. So they didn't have anywhere to play. So they go ahead and they managed to get Arizona University to let them play in the college arena, which is uh, a problem, right? It's it's not big. It's you know they were able to fill it. They actually had more attendance, I think, than at the big maybe. <laughs> Look, I, they, I have filled this quarter teaspoon. Praise. So me. there was some. There were some positives to it, but it's like you can't be having a professional team in the best league playing in a college arena. That doesn't work, right? And and the players were upset with it. It was not sustainable, and so there was a chance for them to get an arena going. But it was it came down to democracy, and the people in Arizona voted no. And when that happened, basically, without making it public, they were like, "All right, that's it, right?" Um, but even after that happened, Ari's the Ar Arizona team owner was still trying to make something else happen, even though he was basically ruined by the you know the fact that people voted against him being able to build the arena. So. He's trying to win this land auction and like, you know, which is coming up in June or July or something to buy land and build a mega arena place or whatever. Yep. Uh, but that's too late for the NHL. Meanwhile, the owner of the Utah Jazz 
is you know mega rich dude who is a lot you know we don't we're not big fans of utah or billionaires and whatnot but that dude has his business shit together much more than the arizona guy that's for sure reading this article here <laughs> yeah so the nhl is like all right we gotta get the team away from the arizona guy and give it to the utah guy so that they can play in Utah, where they can play where the Jazz play, at least until who knows what. It's a better place than the college arena. But he's not they... selling the name, logos, or trademarks. Right. He's they sell... need to do it in a way to where the Arizona guy won't sue them. Right? <laughs> um, and also, the NHL does really want to have a team in Arizona. Like, they believe in the Arizona market. There's a lot of people there, right? It's like they wanted to have a team there. That's why they did all this to make, try to make it work, right, and, and take so long is because they want to have a team in Arizona and they're going to go back, like they want to go back there at some point. So how do we at least temporarily get this team away from this guy and get, you know, and get it somewhere where there's a re arena to play in for next season and not get sued? <laughs> uh, and so you, there is a way that they can, like, take someone's team away, but that would be very difficult and lawyers would fight. Yep. So they're like, fine. We'll give this guy a shit ton of money. We'll let him keep the name and the rights and all and whatnot. And then the uh, AHL team that's still in Arizona, the Tucson yep. Roadrunners. Yep. All, we'll let him keep all kinds of stuff. Uh, but we're going to take away basically the hockey operations part, all the players and the yep. coaches and, the, the, and those hockey staff and move them to Salt Lake. Uh, and this new guy will basically buy, you know, the team from us. And then... Arizona guy, if you get your shit together in the future, you can basically give us the billion dollars back, right? And we'll give you a new franchise deal yep. that you can reuse. Which your would then trigger an expansion draft, which fine. Like the NHL has done that. Like they, they figured out how to do those well. But also there's a five-year time limit. And if at the end of five years, no new team has triggered an expansion draft there, then he, he basically loses this right forever as far as I can tell. Yeah, they're basically like, yeah, they, they, they that's what the NHL wants to happen, right? Yeah. They want him to fail so that they can get someone else to do a team in Arizona. They don't they want to be in Arizona. They want to get away from this guy. And yep. Um, and meanwhile, this guy, the only way to get this franchise expansion to happen for him, he's got to build a what is targeted to be a three billion dollar entertainment center on some land he doesn't own. Yep. Now imagine like he spends money to try to build this thing and he's got it right. And then he ends up missing the mark and not getting right. It's like he, he's, you know, he's is, gonna, he might just build another Xanadu. <laughs> who knows? But, um, you know, but the people I feel, you know, there are people who really got fucked over by this, which are all the staff who have yep. to suddenly move to Salt Lake or quit. Yeah, because think um, about it, NHL players get traded. That's it, and part of your expected that even you might that, get But traded. even those players suddenly are for, being forced to move like that still sucks ass, Yeah, but at right? least it's more part of the job. But if you just, like, work for a team and live in the city that team is and you have to move or quit your job, you're not making millions of dollars. You're not like... No, but there are also people... Uh, who are not part of hockey operations, right? They're part of the they're other employees mm -hmm. of the team. You know, social marketing person, I guess, or ticket selling people, or you know, all kinds of other employees that are not related to the hockey part, right? All those people just lost their jobs. Like, whoop, gone. Your game over. Find a new job in Arizona somewhere, or move. Yeah, you definitely don't want to move to, to Utah with the weird and beer. It, what's extra bad about it is not just that that happened, because, I mean, companies fold and that happens, right? It's that, the, you know, because they're trying to keep things hush-hush to the general public and they drag this out so long, a lot of those people basically got surprised, found out from a journalist tweeting, yep. et cetera, right? As opposed to... You could have told those people in advance, but then the world would know earlier and you don't want that, but that's too bad, right? So just, you know, typical capitalism cruelty happening here. Yep. And of course, uh, you know, less so, but not non-so, all the fans. Imagine if the team that you were a fan of just fucking moved away. Yeah, and it's happened over the years, like in the olden times. Or disappeared. Like a team, well, I forget what the name of the team. I was reading about a team because I wanted to look up how often has the NHL like had to deal with teams having a problem. There have been teams that just like fucking went bankrupt and disappeared suddenly. One time it happened in the middle of a season. Yeah, 
it's like, you know, my grandpa was a Brooklyn Dodgers fan. And then yeah. they moved to LA. It's like, all right, well now what? It's yep. like, Still, wait, still no way to wait. Wait, York, a, wait several years for the Mets to come into existence. That's New York City probably could absorb having a Brooklyn team separate from the Queens team and the and the Yankees all together. I don't think so. I think no. it could. No, we're not even selling out the stadiums they have. Well, because the Mets, uh, the Mets. Actually, I don't know how <laughs> the, the Yankees are, do. I assume the Yankees yeah. don't sell out. No, they don't. You don't. Baseball stadiums don't sell out unless it's like a big game True. or something. You know, it's 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 not that frequent because they're so big. Right? True. It's really hard to sell out unless your team is like really crushing it or you know. All right, you got some some other news that's also capitalism related. Uh, we might. So, uh, Apple has done a good thing, and they're like, hey, you know what? We're gonna let you have uh, emulators for old school game consoles in the app store. Obviously no ROMs, right? Come yeah. on. It's like, yeah, you can't be doing that. Unless Nintendo wants to sell ROMs, they can do that. But, you know, or whoever the actual owner of the game can sell the ROMs. But no, you can't be selling ROMs in the app store. But it's legal to have, you know, Nesticle, I guess. Apple wouldn't let uh, Nesticle with, yeah. with an icon in there. But, you know, <laughs> if you if you want to put an emulator in the app store, they're going to let you do it. But of course, the first person to go and do so throws up a Game Boy emulator and it gets taken down. And it's like, hey, I thought you were going to let in the emulators. That was Why my first the- reaction when I saw a headline about this on FARC until I actually clicked in and read the article. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, we're not taking it down because it's an emulator. We have a new rule allowing emulators. We're taking it down because that's an emulator that was just stolen. Someone just took the emulator from someone else's, someone else's emulator code, <laughs> built it for iOS and uploaded it. That's like, if I took Photoshop and uploaded Scott shop, it's yep. like, <laughs> yeah, uh, we're taking it down for a completely different reason. Um, some emulators did get into the store. If you're interested in emulating old consoles on your iOS devices, uh, seek them out. I don't know which ones are good or even which ones made it uh, past the, Apple Guardians. I might, or I might try a few out just so we can talk about them on the show. Because uh, uh, get your, you're gonna have to get your ROMs from somewhere else if you want to only play legal things. I would suggest going onto like itch.io. You can like buy some, you know, NES games that someone made with like NES Maker or Game Boy Maker or something like that, right? Or you can just download every illegal ROM ever uh, in a in a BitTorrent if you are a criminal. I wouldn't <laughs> spend the ROMs are not illegal. The transfer of them is illegal. They're not illegal ROMs. They're just ROMs. If you move sure. them somewhere, <laughs> you can back up your. You can buy a backup thing and back up your own cartridges. <laughs> I guess all all I'm gonna say is that every ROM of every NES game that was ever released in North America, plus a number of Japanese ones, is 155 megabytes unzipped. Yeah. So personally, these are not I have, big. Yeah. Personally, I have no interest actually because I have. You know, upgraded Game Boy, you know, DSs. I got all kinds of devices on which, you know, I just got the this retro tank that makes that lets me convert basically any kind of old video out to upscaled HDMI. Oh yeah, um, yeah. I saw you posting plugged, that it, it works I, pretty good. I plugged I plugged the Wii into it just now. It worked great. Uh, it actually worked great for a uh, GameCube, even better than Wii. Whoa. Um, and I'm gonna I could you could plug NES into that. You could even it basically takes in SCART RCA component as video so basically all the old ones upscaled hdmi um so uh, hopefully that'll just carry me forever because i don't think there's been any new devices i would definitely (laughs) have bought the exact device you bought except i went the opposite route and actually got rid of all my old consoles yeah well you know uh there may be an occasional need to have an old device and this makes it so you don't have to (laughs) mod those devices anyway the point is i don't need emulators because i have all that shit instead yep one last little news, not to dwell on it, but, uh, you know, Visions of Mana is coming out. It is a the Saiken Detsetsu game series. It's going to be the latest one in that uh, long-running, uh, incredibly iconic... Yeah, incredibly long-running, iconic series where there was really only one mega iconic game, The Secret of Mana, yep. and the other ones weren't so iconic. Well, the Game Boy ones were super popular and widely played in both the U.S. and, and uh, Japan. I did. I do like the, the Game Boy But one. in the U.S., for, those, for anyone who listens to Geek Nights, I'd be surprised if you'd be unaware of this specifically, but they were... Because that Seiken, Seiken Densetsu was not a brand in the U.S., so they were branded well, in wasn't the U.S. It, wasn't it... Uh, 
Gaga first? Uh, uh, yes. That was that was no. Those Saga was Final Fantasy Legend in the U.S. They rebranded all this shit as Final Fantasy oh, because that was the okay. biggest brand in the U.S. I think Saga was rebranded as Final Fantasy Legend, so one, two, and three. But these games were rebranded and reskinned to have characters that looked like Final Fantasy characters in the U.S. as Final Fantasy Adventure on the Game Boy. Mm -hmm. But yeah. anyway, uh, yeah, Secret of Mana was like the biggest one. I have memories of like you and Katsu just trying to beat it over the course of a week in Wildwood at one still point. Have, still never beat it. <laughs> I've never beaten it. Every time we've gotten a group together and tried, we peter out after like eight hours. <laughs> anyway, uh, the newest one is coming out. Uh, and three days ago, the official Japanese trailer for this game was released. I'll link to it. The trailer is three minutes and eight seconds long. And it shows, I'm going to say... Zero footage from Visions of Mana. And yet, <laughs> and yet, it is possibly what it is either the most full of itself and pretentious trailer of all time, or they're pulling a sort of Cowboy Bebop, you know, the show that was like, yeah, we made a new genre, eat it, <laughs> right in the beginning. This trailer is basically, yeah, we made one of the best fucking most popular games ever that affected people in a big way and our entire marketing pitch is remember mana games remember that shit well here's the one yeah they could have who knows if this game is actually any fucking good right it's just they're just trying to be like nostalgia please buy this game but they the way they pro the, this is a very well produced trailer uh the other thing that's noteworthy this trailer is 95 percent live action <laughs> And nobody is in costumes. Okay. Anyway, things of the day. Uh, I just found this channel randomly, and it's super cute. Uh, SQFT Fish. And this is a tiny little 30-second video. And a little fish uh, asks a little crab for a ride. And a little bit of drama ensues in 29 seconds. And it's just super cute. And I learned something about that kind of crab and that kind of fish. Okay. Uh, so way back in the day, there was a game called Descent, and then there was Descent 2, and then there was the much lesser known Descent 3, but I bought Descent 3 as soon as it came out on two CD-ROMs. I know, I want to say you still had those CD-ROMs in RIT, because you brought Descent I, up I a still lot. Have the, I still have them now. But you, you, <laughs> you brought Descent up about as often as I brought up Aerobiz back then. Eh, the point is, I have Descent 3, I still have the discs, we could play it if you want. Um, but... Somebody uh, took the source code for Descent 3 that has apparently been as somewhat recently patched and, like, actually worked on Windows and Mac OS, like, a few years ago because someone patched it. And they only had to remove, like, a couple libraries from Interplay um, that were obviously proprietary that allow you to play the cutscenes. And he's like, hey... You know, maybe we could work on replacing that code so we can actually see the cutscenes and decode the videos because they have like a custom video format or something. Um, but it's like actively being worked on by at least some people to, to, you know, rather than like, you know, a lot of games will like make a new engine that you just load the data from the old game to play it or, you know, just emulate. It's like this is the actual, mostly the actual source code of the actual game. Just like patching it to update it. And rather than the Quake model, where the official company is doing it, this is some people just open source doing it. Uh, but same thing. There are like so, 32 commits today. This is this has picked up a little steam, I think. Uh, it was uploaded like earlier today or yesterday. Like when Okay, they made so this the is super new. This is super new. Like this just happened. It's super fresh. It's a thing of the day, literally. Um, <laughs> I recommend... Uh, Trying to set one and two, <laughs> and if you enjoy, then Descent three, and I'm, and you can get all these I think on GOG.com very easily. Pretty sure I um, got them on GOG and just never played them on a modern computer. If you have an account on GOG, you probably have Descent one two three. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, there really isn't. You know, aren't games like Descent? You know, there have been some people making a few, but. They are not. Yeah, like there's there's game. lots of games that are like Doom. There's lots of games that are like Quake and like like Unreal Tournament. But Art there's a lot less that are like Descent. Exactly. Descent was just, there's a lot of uniqueness that's out of scope for things of the day and a show that's already running long because sure we did a show on Descent. 
<laughs> in the meta moment, the Geek Nights Book Club book, Walk On, uh, The Night is Short, Walk On Girl. Uh, within a few weeks, we'll do it. Uh, no show this Thursday, because I'm out of town to help my mom oh, with the okay. thing. So I'm flying out well, to Detroit on Thursday. I'll be back well, on I got, Sunday. I got plenty of time, because now there's no hockey to eat up my evenings yep. for, until the playoffs start, which will be probably, prob- we don't know the schedule yet, but probably Sunday at the soonest. So Yep, and I got... Uh, Two flights plus about eight hours of hanging out in a hospital waiting room for, to be clear, like not a dire thing, but like a thing that is a success story that's going well. But I get to sit in a hospital for a while to wait. No, so I'll probably finish the whole book go, there. When you come back. I'll be back Sunday, so Geek Nights should resume as normal on Monday, unless I'm somehow tired and burnt out from the trip, which is unlikely, in which case Geek Nights can resume on Wednesday. And I'll just have to well, read something. I guess something. if there's a playoff game Sunday, you're not going. If there is a playoff game Sunday, I am not going. That's a shame. Yeah, it is a shame. <laughs> Emily, I mean, I will say right now, Emily and I will. It will not be difficult to find someone oh yeah, to we, go to. We will market. go to any game that is available if we are not, like, physically prevented from doing so. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I, I, even, I will even look to see if I could even get additional tickets, potentially, because... Yeah, you, if you have money, you can. <laughs> I'll pay you with what? Money! <laughs> All right, let's just get right into the main bit. So uh, we've this game appeared, we saw it first at PAX like a long time ago. I forget how many years ago. I'm and, pretty sure it was like in PAX West in like one of the little side rooms in the escalator area. Yeah. And it was like, or out in the hallway, I think, in the escalator area. But and basically- it was, like all, it was all by itself. It was either at the time brand new or it was new to the US because I think the game comes from- uh, Europe. Denmark. Yes, it's a Dutch game. It's apparently Danish, a popular Danish pub game. game in Denmark. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, it's a uh, Danish game. But I'll admit, when I first saw it, for at least a couple of PAXs, I straight up ignored it because I, I like air hockey. I'm a huge fan of air hockey. And I superficially looked at it and just thought, that just looks like tiny air hockey. Oh, I didn't, I didn't ignore it. I, the first time I saw it, I sat down and demoed it and played it a bit. But I, And the only reason I never bought it was like, I'm going to I'm going to carry this back on the plane with me uh, really or where am I going to put this? Am I really going to play this thing? You know, all right, it's really cool, but Well, cuz what I, I remember one? is you mentioned that you played it and that it was actually good and I made a point the oh, next it, time. Oh, yeah, it was good. Yeah, so the next time I was at a PAX, I made a point of going over and actually playing it and that's when I learned what was good about it specifically, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but again, I had the same thought Scott did. Ooh, this is really fun. I could see myself playing this. I don't really want to put it in my suitcase. How often? Where? When? So fast forward further. uh, Every time I'm at a PAX from this point forward, I'd play it a few times if like I was walking by with people. And at the most recent PAX Unplugged, Emily and I and a bunch of our friends sat, or no, with the PAX West we did this. We sat down on our own at the Clask area because not the guy who invented Clask or like owns the company, but like the guy who, as best we could tell, runs the competitive scene in America for Clask, he was like running the table. So he didn't just like let us play. He facilitated our play, taught us techniques and just like hung out with us for about an hour and a half while we all just played Clask over and over and over again. Uh, Emily is scarily good at Clask. Uh, She beats me reliably still. But uh, after that, I went from, I'd like to own this, but I don't want to fly home with it to, I really want to own this but I'm worried that it'll sit in my apartment and take up space. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Then, But then coming into my lab was a couple hundred dollars worth of uh, free money for Millennium Games, and I saw Clask MSRP just sitting right there, and I had a car, so I thought, you know what? Fuck it. And I got it, and we played it a bunch already. I'm getting better. I've learned some things about it, and I feel like Emily and I are intentionally going to cause the air hockey problem for ourselves in this game the same way you and I did unintentionally for air hockey. So the game of Clask, what is up with this game? So you have this little table and you actually put your hand underneath the table and in your hand you hold a magnet on a stick. A strong magnet. Like it's a pretty beefy magnet. It's pretty strong. It's not like neodymium, but it's pretty strong. It goes. It's strong enough to go through wood. Yeah. And so on top of the table, you have this sort of black pawn with a really tall hat. Um, And you attach your magnet to that and you can move it around. So it's like, 
you know, in air hockey or, you know, knock hockey, it's sort of like your actual body has to go mm-hmm. into the field, your arm at least, and that sort of can interfere with the game. Yep. Whereas here, because you're controlling this sort of avatar, like a little athlete guy, it's a little bit more like, um, what's the one with the spinny soccer guys? Oh, foosball? Foosball. It's a little bit more like foosball where like, yep. or, or uh, what's it called? Uh, air, uh, hockey with the, you know, with the sticks, the bubble hockey. I've always um, just called that bubble hockey. I don't know what is if slot hockey. I've I don't heard know it called what it, too. Yeah, but it's a little bit more like that, where you're sort of like remote controlling this guy. Um, you're you're and you're not interfering in any way. And so you move this. That's all you can do to play the game is move your hand with this magnet. You can't interfere with it in any other way. It's not allowed, right? And so seems like it is play- just called bubble hockey. Slot hockey okay. is not a common name for it. All right. So in the playing field. You have this basically t- a circular indentation, right? It's sort of like a like almost like a golf hole. Yeah, it's not very shallow, and there's a ball, and if that ball, the ball is not magnetic in any way, so it's just a plastic ball, and you can knock that ball around using your little guy, right? So if you you move your guy quickly and he hits the ball, you can hit the right, and if you get the ball into the other person's indentation. It's a lot like the indentation on a crocodile. Yeah. And then you get a point for doing that. And so you're playing basically a hockey game. And underneath the table, you don't even need a rule for this because underneath the table, there is a wooden barrier. So you physically cannot get your guy past the halfway line yep. because your hand can't, your hand can't get through. It, there's no way to get over there. Right. Now, before we even get into the other rules, that alone is pretty air hockey adjacent, but even if there were no other rules, this introduces significant gameplay consequences that might not be obvious. So number one, games like air hockey where your hand's right in there, this also means your raw strength and power are directly applied to the game with no limits. So Mm -hmm. in air hockey, one, that can lead to injury. Like I've hurt myself pretty badly playing air hockey before but two Mm. it means if you're really strong or hyper aggressive that can be a dominant strategy against someone who isn't super strong or isn't hyper aggressive with the magnet system in a game like this if you try to be hyper aggressive your magnet will disconnect itself with your violence from your little guy and you kind of screw yourself or also the playing field is so small Right, it's not yep. like a big air hockey table where like the power has. Yeah, when I do a power shot in air hockey, I, it's like I'm swinging a sword as hard as I can with my whole body. Right, like what's the size of a class table? Like a foot, a little over a foot long. It's not, it's not that big. Yeah, right? less than two feet, I want to say. Um, and it's not very wide either. Maybe it's a foot wide by like maybe it's a legal piece of paper, a little bit bigger than that. A little bit bigger than that, A4? but it's small. Like it fits. And it fits, it's about this, it's smaller than our HTPC, and it just fits next to it. Yeah, it's it's not large. So you don't really have space to use that power. And even if you had more power, how would it help you, right? Yep. It's like a flick of a wrist is about max power in class. You don't yep. need more than that. It would make no sense. But air, because human... it's an indentation <laughs> uh, instead of a goal in air <laughs> hockey, if you hit the goal, it goes in, no matter how fast it's going. Here, if you hit the ball <clears> super fast, it's going to bounce right out of that little hole, and you don't score anything. Yep, that's true. So it's about a deft right, hand. Like... It's about precision. <laughs> Uh, and already, so this is significant, good gameplay just from those rules. Now there are additional and significantly rules. different from other games like it. Yep. And you're basically just play really simple, like pong rules, like first to six. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's, that's it. So that's already a fun game, but then class goes to the next level and adds something extra right? in the middle of the field are these three evenly spaced white little knoblies and those knoblies have magnets in them. Well, the, but very importantly, they have magnets on one side. Mm-hmm. They start mm-hmm. facing up on the top, and the other side does not have a magnet. So they are asymmetrical. That is very important. Yep. And so what's up with these? Well, obviously, they're obstacles. They can sort of get in the way of the ball and also get in the way of your guy. Yep. Right? Because they're, you know, it's like you try to hit the ball straight at their goal. If you hit it right down the middle, well, one of the things starts in the middle. So that's not going to work, right? Um, but two, there is a special rule, which is that if two of those little magnet guys become attached to your guy, right, you lose a point. The ball doesn't matter. It's an alternate victory condition. If two out of three of those are stuck to you, because remember, you're holding a magnet, 
your dude, your player is yep. magnetic. And if you and even get close to these things, they start, you can see them like quivering in anticipation. And then yeah. if you get a little closer, they will fly at your guy and stick to him so fast you can't react to it. Yep. I mean, it's the speed of magnets. It's faster than the speed of human muscles. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if two of them get stuck to you, you're in trouble. So if you can send them into the other player's play area away from their starting position, the other player's movement will become very restricted. Like, let's say you get them all on, like, the left side of the other player's field, and then you try to bounce the ball off over into that area and try to bank it into the goal. How are they going to go to defend? If they try to go to defend, maybe they'll stop the ball from going in the goal. Maybe they won't. But if two of those things get stuck to them, that's the same as scoring a goal. Yep. So what do you care, right? You can put people in tough situations if you can knock those things to their side of the field. Um, let's say the other player is trying to play the ball, right, and, like, build up a shot. Just, you know, meanwhile, these three things are sitting in the middle of the field just sitting there. The experts showed me that there is a technique where if you quickly approach and then back away from these things in a certain way due to magnetic fields being polarized, you can actually get near them and hit them, right, with enough, you know, speed and back up so that the force with which you hit them overpowers the initial magnetic attraction and you can actually send them and hit them at your opponent with some skill and technique if you practice it. I learned an even more advanced technique from the guy that we couldn't yep. execute, but now having the game at home, I can almost execute it where you don't even have to touch it. If you, if it's sitting somewhere magnet up and you go laterally across it as fa at a certain speed, mm -hmm. then it will move towards you and it's like you shot it like a gun. So yep. if it's in your zone, you can use that to shoot it at the other side. But yep. that only applies if the little magnet, remember we said they're asymmetrical, is face up. If the magnets face down, they behave differently and they're kind mm -hmm. of repulsed at first and you have to use a different technique. So there is a, I guess, this is a long way of saying there is an extremely... And if they're, and if they're on edge, they roll around. <laughs> yeah. So there is a very like surprisingly high skill cap of advanced techniques around this game because of all these combinations of factors. Right. So the ball is really easy, right? Anyone understands that because it's not magnetic. You just sort of hit it, right? And that's it just obeys the laws of physics. But I guess the magnets also obey the laws of physics, but different, right? The magnetic laws, not the kinetic laws. Also the kinetic laws. Um, and so if you're like sitting there, like trying to line up a shot, you're giving the other player a lot of time to mess with those things, like send them at you, right? If they're <laughs> skilled enough to use those techniques to send them at, it's like a risk reward, right? It's like, you got to go near those things to be able to attack with them, which puts you at risk of getting them stuck to yourself. Oh, right. But if you're I'd good, you if you're good at it, the risk significantly reduces. And yeah, you can reliably just shoot them at the yeah, opponent. The, the super good guy that we played with, he at one point he was like, "All right, let's sit down. I'm going to show. I'm going to show you the full extent of my power." And he was just like directing them around like he was psychic. It was amazing to behold. Yep. And so this is perfect, right? Because if you think about it, there's a lot of games out there that have multiple victory conditions, right? You know, um, I think about Magic the Gathering. You can do 20 damage, you can deck someone, or you can poison someone. Ah, I don't poison. Know if, My whole I don't know life was dedicated <laughs> in childhood to win. poison. I don't know poison. if that's still in the game or not. If it's poison's rid of still that. in Magic as far as I'm aware. Okay. And decking is definitely some versions still in magic. of Magic the Gathering this poison and there might be some other Magic the Dude, Gathering poison variants came that I don't out, know about. Poison was introduced in uh way early like never. Regardless, right? There's at least two victory conditions, right? You don't you can go for I, I but when antiquities? you're in a game like hmm? Anyway, when you're when you're in a game like that that has multiple victory conditions, you sort of have to pick one and go all in on it. Yeah, think about if a German style like Euro point salad game. You're picking one. If you pick more than one, that is literally how you lose. Right. If you try to spread the wealth and go for both victory conditions at the same time, you're dedicating not enough resources to either one, and so neither ends up getting completed. Someone else who dedicates their life solely to one victory condition will achieve it and therefore win, while you're still halfway to two different conditions. In Clask, it's real-time and it's sporty, all right? And so the victory condition of get the ball into the hole and the victory condition of get two of these things attached to your opponent 
are happening simultaneously. And so if the ball is on the other opponent's side, you can work on, you know, getting magnets over to their side. And if the ball's over on your side, you can try to score a goal with it while they're maybe working their magnets. I I have tried to do a thing. If you're really skilled, you can probably do all of these things all at once. So you're trying to go for all the victory conditions simultaneously at all times. And it ends up just being effectively unlimited fun. Like I could see this not having a cap on my interest. Yeah. The key is not just that there's, you know, deep strategic depth to having two victory conditions and having to sort of juggle simultaneous offense and defense at all times, but that it's fun for all players at all times, because Mm. you are always doing something. And, you know, in air hockey, it's like, Yes, yeah, sometimes you have the puck and sometimes you don't, right? And when you don't, you're just sort of standing there waiting to defend, yep. I guess. Or like even in ping pong, it's like, or tennis, it's like you hit the ball and like, yeah, you're looking where it's going. Yeah. It's going to come you back pretty soon. You can set up your position, but that's all you can yeah. set up. It's going to come back to you pretty soon, but that's still a very few seconds of like this downtime where you're thinking or whatever, right? In Clask, there is zero downtime. You are, if you want to be good at it at least, downtime is just hurting you. There is like, if you're not actively working the ball or the stones or both, you're just falling behind you know in like? your position. Advanced no FPS, what. like Overwatch is a good example. APM, if you're not constantly doing something, you're just a waste of space on your team. Right. And so there really isn't, you know, another game that's like kind of like that with the, with the, you know, constant action table sport doesn't actually require, you know, gr- big physical, yep. you know, skill. And I think that- just, it's all fingers, wrist, you know, and a little bit of arm action. But that's also what I think is the magic here, that this game is not that big. Like, it does not take up any space in our apartment. It's small, and having bought one now, instead of just using the ones that are out at a PAX, it's super well-constructed. Like, Mm -hmm. it's... The, this is not chintzy. It's very late. La- if it's not level, yep, it's your make, fault. It's not yeah, its fault. You should make sure you buy. There might be bootleg clasks. I don't know. Make sure you buy a legitimate one because the construction of it is extremely important. It's made out of like really solid wood. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, the, the pieces are very specific. So if you play with like some bootleg one, like the weights could be off, the magnetic strength could be off, the size of the ball and the weight of the ball might be off. Right. You need to get a legit clask. Um, right. It's not like, you know, a basketball where it's like, yeah, you don't actually need an NBA basketball. Yeah. You'll be fine with a college basketball or a high school basketball. Right? But also like tumbling dice, you- which is not actually that good a game. We just like it. That's like the re-release of that is like a hundred bucks MSRP. Uh, mm-hmm. lots of physical games are very expensive for a lot of class is 60 bucks. Like I've paid more for games that were just cardboard. <laughs> yep. Now the other thing, right is that not only is there Clask, but some years ago they oh. came out with Clask 4 Player. Yep. Which is I have not bucks. actually tried Clask 4 Player. It is a circular arena instead of a rectangle. Uh, and it has, I think, uh, five of the uh, obstacle yep, magnets. Yep, there's five shaped like the D, the five face of a D6, and the players are in a circle opposing each other, and everyone has their own goal. But they think there's still only one ball, right? Only one ball. Yeah. So you, I guess in that game, if the ball goes in your hole, that's bad. Um, I don't know the rules of like, if a ball goes in your hole, but then... Oh, here we go. I found the get... r- Everyone starts with five lives. The game I ends see. when one player reaches zero. I see. So you could just die. Whenever anyone dies, do you stop playing and sort of reset the board? Yep. Looks like whoever died kicks off. What if two? What if like? What if the ball goes in your hole and a second magnet grabs onto me and it's somewhat simultaneous and we don't have video? Oh, the the rules from regular class. Uh, what I saw in that section. uh, Forgive me if I mischaracterize it because I'm just quoting from memory. It said effectively, if two actions that would cause a point to be scored occur simultaneously or undifferentiable, redo it. Okay, Uh, so it's okay to let it in your thing if you're you know, if someone else dies at the same time. As long as it is truly simultaneous. I feel like it's a call on the table. 
Yeah, I would think so. You, like in you a know, pro in tournament, a, obviously you're going to have a ref. You're going to have video case. replay in a pro tournament. Yeah. And it's going to be resolved, right? There are, I would suggest if you go on YouTube or the internet and look for Clask Pro Play, there's plenty of it to watch, right? This game has grown and gotten serious. Like there are people who are like, really playing this for real uh, that's kind of why i want I, we got it to play it and get good at it because as much as i love air hockey when i go to pax there ain't gonna be an air hockey table there like i, very yeah, few I don't know if the four player class has too much serious competitive play because it can get political yep. but the two player class has like serious tournaments that happen um you can i think you can even win some prizes maybe if you become the best at Clask in the world that Not, is, it can't be that big, but but that's kind of why I got it at home. Much like having DDR at home, there's also DDR machine. At least there used to be in the wild. Clask at home means if I go to a PAX and there's a Clask, I could join the tournament or play against someone who's really good. There's a higher mm -hmm. chance of that than air hockey. I would also recommend if you buy a Clask, right, that they do sell a spare parts <clears throat> package that has extra balls, magnets, pieces. Yep. Um, you're going to want to buy just buy at least one of those because you're going to lose a magnet. You're, you're gonna, something's going to happen. You know, a piece will get worn now, out or something. The default something. game <clears throat> does come with uh, two extra of the little biscuits. They're, that's what they're yeah. called. Two okay. balls. Uh, so, yeah, you have an extra, you have an extra ball the, and an extra biscuit. Yeah. But if you're really going to – if you don't play Clask enough – to burn through those spare parts and need more, yep. you didn't play the classic enough to be worth buying. Right? Unless you live in a tiny New York apartment where it's kind of impossible to lose a biscuit because there's not that many square feet it could go into. I guess unless I it like rolls under the molding into the wall, then it's gone forever. I suppose. You can, the other thing is, uh, another good thing to have if you're playing classic is an extending magnet stick because... If you drop pieces onto the ground other than the ball, you can retrieve biscuits and Ooh, things from, that's from, a good underneath idea. The, from underneath the table with your extending magnet stick. That's um, a good idea. And the that other... can help you stay that can help you stay seated while playing Clask. The other thing is that even if you don't permanently lose any of your pieces and need replacements, just having spare Clask parts next to you, it's like let's say you're playing a Clask and a biscuit goes flying into the kitchen. It's like, all right, you just grab a spare biscuit and you keep playing and you go later collecting all the ones yeah. that went flying. Well, like when you play ping pong, right? usually, unless you're playing in a super serious tournament, you're holding, if you're right-handed, you're holding two or three extra balls just in your left hand so you can just serve right away and not have to wait to pick up all the balls every point. Yeah, if you're playing tennis, there's <laughs> ball people around the, the edges of the court, right, who grab and toss new balls to you and, you know, yep. you even keep some in your pocket anyway. But when I was playing one-on-one so, -on -one tennis, like with my brother when we were kids, a lot of times we'd both just be holding the ball in our off hand just to be able to quickly get back to play. Yep. So that's a that's a good reason to buy a few extra Clask bits if you're going hard on the Clask. The last thing, if you're going hard on the Clask, I'd recommend you get is get a small pack of shims, like furniture shims, just so that whatever t whatever surface you put Clask on, you can level it appropriately because the game I is thought it best. Came with a, I thought it came with a couple. It didn't come with any shims. It did go, well, it comes with the rule book, and the guy said, oh, yeah, just use the rule book as a shim. Usually that'll uh. work. But yeah, the Clask, you, if you buy a legit Clask, all the ones that I've seen have been very well leveled and constructed. Yep. So if your table is level and smooth and your the building you're in is level and smooth, and etc., you shouldn't need any kind of shimmage going on. But yep. that is obviously not the case. You might bring your Clask somewhere. You might have a meh table. Who knows? There might be an earthquake. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and... Yeah, you're going to want to somehow have some mechanism to level the Clask, even by a really tiny little level, right? And so that way you can check to make sure the Clask is, is flat when you set it up. Yeah, I don't think they've never used this in the Omegathon. I feel like this would be a really good Omegathon finale at some point. Really? It's never been Omegathon? I don't think it has been. If it has, I didn't see it. A uh, listener just asked, and I, my gut reaction was no, because I feel like I remember every Omega. It's been familiar. around like a long time, but I think it's worth talking about now, not just because you bought it recently, finally, but because I've seen it gaining steam over the years. It's only gotten bigger. Yep. Um, which is kind of surprising, right? That like you think that like this cute little game would be like sort of this novelty, right? Rather than like a long-lasting thing and a scene built up around it and is is growing. So. Uh, you know, now it is like peak class, you know, even though it's at least man, you how too, old is your it search already? is like getting so I search for like just class Omegathon final, and 
without saying, oh, well, class didn't appear in the search. It returned a video that is the video of Black Emperor. Oh, so thank you. Class is, class is from 2014, and so it's 10 years old. Another great reason to talk about class. 10-year oh. anniversary of class. Yeah. So uh, if any of you are out of PAX and there's a class, I'll play with you. Because uh, I want to show right. off that yep. I'm going to be slightly better than the average Classker because I own it. Yep. All right. And...